The day after Nelson gets back, Harry and Janice go to Mount Judge for dinner. Nelson meets his parents at the door, and after embracing his mother, attempts to do the same with his father, awkwardly wrapping both arms around the much taller man and pulling him down to rub scratchy cheeks. Harry is taken by surprise and not pleased. The embrace feels showy and queer and forced, the kind of thing these TV evangelists tell you to do to one another before they run off screen and get their secretaries to lay them. The kid has shaved his mustache and taken off his earring. His upper lip, exposed again, seems long and puffy and bulging outward. The boy moves with a certain old lady stiffness, as if the rehab has squeezed the drugs and the jitters out of him, but also his natural nervous quickness. For the first time, he seems to his father middle-aged, and his thinning hair and patches of exposed scalp part of him, and not just a condition that will heal. Prue, in her turn, seems bewildered by suddenly having a minister for a husband. When Harry bends down, expecting the soft, warm push of her lips on his, he gets instead her dry cheek, averted with a fearful quickness. He is hurt, but can't believe he has done anything wrong. Since their episode that wild and windy night, the silence from her side has indicated a wish to pretend it never happened, and with his silence he has indicated that he is willing. So he doesn't like to feel even this small alteration in Prue's temperature, this coolness like a rebuke. The children eat with them, Judy and Harry on one side of the Springer's mahogany dining room table, set as if for a holiday, Janice and Roy on the other, Prue and Nelson at the heads. Nelson offers grace. He makes all hold hands and shut their eyes, and after they're ready to scream with embarrassment, pronounces the words, peace, health, sanity, love. Amen, says Prue, sounding scared. Nice, Harry tells his son. That's something you learned at the detox place? Not detox, Dad, rehab. You got to admit you're powerless and dependent on a higher power. That's the first principle of AA and NA. As I remember it, you didn't used to go much for any higher power stuff, Harry says. Nelson looks toward Janice in protest and appeal, and she says, Nelson, tell us about the counseling work you did. As Nelson speaks, he sits with a curious, tranquilized stillness. Most of you says you just listen and let them work it out through their own verbalization. Once in a while, you have to remind them you've been there yourself, and their war stories don't impress you. A lot of them have been dealers, and when they start bragging how much money they made, all you have to do is ask, where is it now? They don't have it. They blew it. Speaking of blowing it, Harry begins, you're already 150000 in the hold of Toyota, Inc., and two weeks to pay it off in. Not to mention the seventy-five grand you owe Brewer Trust. Not to mention the used you sold for cash you put in your own pocket. Harry, Janice says, gesturing toward their audience of staring children. This isn't the place. There is no place where I can get a handle on what this rotten kid has done. Over two hundred thousand fucking shekels. Where's it going to come from? Sparks of pain flicker beneath the muscles of his chest. He feels a dizziness in which the faces at the table float as in a sickening soup. Bad sensations have been worsening lately. It's been over three months since that angioplasty opened his coronary artery. Dr. Bright warned that restenosis often sets in after three months. Janice is saying, But he's learned so much, Harry. He's so much wiser. It's as if we sent him to graduate school with the money. School, all this school, what's so great about school all of a sudden? School's just another rip-off. All it teaches you is how to rip off dopes that haven't been to school yet. As he shakes out a nitrostat from the small bottle he carries everywhere, he sees his hands trembling in a new way, not just a tremor, but jumping as if with thoughts all their own that they aren't sharing with him. From the head of the table, Nelson radiates calm and solidity. Dad, I was an addict. I admit it. But that money I stole didn't all go to my habit. Lyle needed big money for some experimental stuff the FDA jerks are sitting on and has to be smuggled in from Europe. 
Lyle, Harry says with satisfaction. How is the old computer whiz? He seems to be holding his own for the time being. He'll outlive me, Harry says, as a joke, but the real possibility of it stabs him like an icicle. Harry, Nelson is coming back to the lot tomorrow, Janice says. Great, that's a relief. I wanted to say, Dad, thanks for filling in. The summer stat sheets look pretty good, considering, Nelson says. Considering we pulled off a miracle over there. He turns to Janice and says, I can't believe you're putting this loser back in charge. Janice says, in the calm tone everybody at the table is acquiring, as if to humor a madman, he's not a loser. He's your son, and he's a new person. We can't deny him a chance. In a voice more wifely than Janice's, Prue adds, He really has changed, Harry. A day at a time, Nelson recites, with the help of a higher power. When it's time to go home, Harry asks Janice to drive the Celica, though it means adjusting the seat and the mirrors. You really don't want me back at the lot? He looks down at his hands. Their jumping has subsided, but is still fascinating. I think for now, Harry, let's give Nelson the space. He's trying so hard. You've been looking tired. Have you been losing weight? A couple pounds. Isn't that good? Isn't that what the hell I'm supposed to be doing? It depends on how you do it, Janice says, so maddeningly full of new information, new presumption. She reaches over and gives his inner upper thigh, right where they inserted the catheter, and he could have bled to death. A squeeze. We'll be fine, she lies. The next day, when Harry comes in from golf, the phone is ringing and he has to rush to get it. Dad, what's the matter? Nelson asks. Nothing. Why? You sound so winded. I just came in, Harry says. I thought you were your mother. Mom's been here. I'm still at the lot. She suggested I call you. I've got this great idea. This weekend I was visiting a guy I know, Jason, who has a river cottage, and this fantastic thing goes by, a motorcycle on the water. They have different names for them, uh, wet bikes, surf jets, jet skis. Yeah, I've seen them in Florida, out on the ocean, Harry says. They look unsafe. Dad, this was the best I ever saw. It went like a rocket. Jason said it's called a Yamaha Wave Runner, and he said the only guy who sells them can't keep them in stock. And anyway, he's not that interested. He's a retired farmer who just does it as a hobby. So I called Yamaha's sales office in New York this morning and talked to a guy. It wouldn't be just wave runners we'd sell. We'd carry the motorcycles and their snowmobiles and trailers. What do you think? Okay, now remember, you asked. I think it's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Jet skis are a fad. Next year, it'll be jet roller skates. You're almost 33, and you're still into toys and fads. You come back from that detox place stuffed full of good intentions, and now you're getting rocks in the brain again. There is a pause. You say detox just to bug me, Nelson says. It was a treatment center, and then a halfway house for rehab. The detox part of it just takes a couple days. It's getting the relational poison out of your system that lasts longer. Let's cut the psychology and get down to earth, Harry says. What the hell do you and your mother intend to do about that $150,000 Toyota has to have by the end of the month, or else it will prosecute? Oh, the boy says early, D didn't Mom tell you? That's been settled. They've been paid. We took out a loan, a second mortgage on the lot property, it's worth at least half a million. And you're somehow going to pay back Brewer Trust selling water scooters? You don't have to pay a loan back, Nelson says. They don't want you to pay it back. They just want you to keep up the installments. Thank God you're back in the saddle. How does your mother like the Yamaha connection? She's not like you. She's open and willing to be creative. Why do you resent it, me and Mom getting out into the world and trying to learn new things? I don't resent it. I respect it, Harry says. You hate it. You're envious and jealous. You feel stuck, and you want everybody to be stuck with you. 
It wasn't me, he says, who ran Springer Motors into the ground. But do what you want. You're the Springer, not me. He can hear a voice in the background, a female voice. Tell Elvira I miss her, he says. Hanging up, Harry pictures the showroom, the late afternoon light on the dust on the display window, taller and balder than ever with all the banners down, and the fun going on, amazingly, without him. The thready lawn behind their little limestone house at 14 and a half Franklin has the dry kiss of autumn on it now, brown patches and the first few fallen leaves cast off by the weeping cherry, his neighbor's black walnut, the sweet cherry that leans close to the house so he can watch the squirrels scrabble along its branches. The forsythia and beauty bush both have been getting out of hand during this wet summer, and Harry, on this cloudy, cool Thursday before the Labor Day weekend, has been trying to prune them back into shape for the winter. To placate the pain in his chest, he switches to weeding the daylilies and the violet hosta. Janice pulls in in the pearl-gray Camry wagon. She is fresh from the afternoon class at the Penn State Extension on Pine Street. She walks to him over what seems a great distance in the little quarter-acre yard. How was class? he dutifully asks. Our teacher seems so sad and preoccupied lately, she says. We think his wife is leaving him. She came to class once and acted very snooty, we all thought. You all are getting to be a tough crowd. Aren't these classes about over? Labor Day is coming. Poor Harry, do you feel I've deserted you this summer? What are you going to do with all this mess you've pruned away? The beauty bush looks absolutely ravaged. He admits, I was getting tired and making bad decisions. That's why I stopped. He leans the long-handled clippers in the garage against the wall behind a dented metal trash can and hangs the pruning saw on its nail. Shadowy in her sundress, Janice moves ahead of him up the back stairs and the kitchen light comes on. Inside the kitchen, she rummages with that baffled, frowning expression of hers in the refrigerator for edible fragments. How do you feel about Brussels sprouts, she asks him. I don't mind them. To me, they always taste spoiled, but they're all we have. I promise to get to the IGA tomorrow and stock up for the long weekend. We going to have Nelson and his tribe over? I thought we might all meet at the club. We've hardly used it this summer. He sounded hyper on the phone. Do you think he's back on the stuff already? Harry, Nelson is very straight now. That place really has given him religion. But I agree, Yamaha isn't the answer. We must raise some capital and put ourselves on a solvent basis before we start courting another franchise. I've been talking to some of the other women getting their licenses, and they all thought it was grotesque to be carrying a mortgage amounting to over 2500 a month on the lot when we have other property. Rabbit doesn't like the trend here. You'd sell this place? Well, Harry, it is very extravagant to keep it just for the summer, essentially, especially when there's all that extra room over at Mother's. I love this place, he tells her. And where would Nelson and Prue go? They'd be there, obviously, just the way we and Nelson used to live with Mother and Daddy. That wasn't so bad, was it? In fact, it was nice. Nelson and Prue would have built-in babysitters, and I wouldn't have to do all this housekeeping by myself. Those bands of constriction, with their edges pricked out in pain, have materialized across Harry's chest. How do Nelson and Prue feel about us moving in? I haven't asked yet. I thought I might this evening after I ran it by you. I really don't see how they can say no. It's my house, legally. So, what do you think? I hate it offhand, he tells her. I don't want to go back to living as somebody's tenant. We did that for 15 years and finally got out of it. People don't live all bunched up, all the generations, anymore. But they do. That's one of the trends in living, now that homes have become so expensive and the world so crowded, Janice says. Rabbit shrugs. You go over after supper and see how they like your crazy plan. I'm dead set against it, if my vote counts. 
Of course your vote counts. It counts more than anybody's, honey, Janice says. He and Janice let the house issue sit as a silent sore spot between them while they eat. He helps her clear, and they add their plates to those already stacked in the dishwasher, waiting to be run through. She calls Nelson to see if they're going to be in, and puts her white cardigan back on and gets back into the silica and drives off to Mount Judge, Wonder Woman. Harry catches the tail end of Peter Jennings, a bunch of twitchy old black-and-white clips about World War II beginning with the invasion of Poland 50 years ago tomorrow. The phone wakes him when it rings. He looks at the thermostat clock as he goes to the hall phone. 9.20. Janice has been over there a long time. Harry. He has never heard Janice's voice sound like this. So stony, so dead. Hi, where are you? I was getting afraid you'd had an accident. Harry, I... Now she is speaking through tears, staggering over gulps, suppressed sobs, lumps in her throat. I described my idea to Nelson and Prue, and we all agreed we shouldn't rush into it. We should discuss it thoroughly. He seemed more receptive than she. After she'd put the children to bed, she came down with this look on her face and said there was something then that Nelson and I should know if we were all going to live together. Yeah? His own voice is still casual, but he is no longer sleepy. He can see what is coming like a tiny dot in the distance that becomes a rocket ship in a space movie. She said, you and she slept together that night. You stayed your first night out of the hospital. The spaceship is upon him with all its rivets and blinking lights. She said that? Yes, she did. Well, is she telling the truth? Well, honey, what can I say? I, I guess in a way, a big sob. He can picture Janice's face exactly, twisted and helpless and ugly, old age collapsing in upon her. Oh, Harry, how could you? Your own daughter-in-law, Nelson's wife. This is the worst thing you've ever done, ever Ever. The absolute worst. Really? The word comes out with an unintended, hopeful lilt. I will never forgive you. Never, Janice says, returning to a dead-level tone. Don't say that, he begs. It was just a crazy moment that didn't hurt anybody. We want you over here, Harry, she says. Me? Why? It's late, he says. I'm bushed from all those bushes. Don't think you're out of this and can be cute. Nelson is being very calm and using all that good psychological work he learned at the treatment center. He says this will take a lot of processing, and we must begin right now. You get right over here and help undo some of the damage you've done for once in your life. And she hangs up, having sounded comically like her mother in the juicy way she pronounced, for once. A life is guided by a few revelations. These must be followed when they come. Rabbit sees clearly what to do. He goes upstairs and packs. He leaves a light burning in the upstairs hall to discourage burglars and the carriage lamp beside the front door numbered 14 and a half. He loads the car in two trips, feeling the weight of the suitcases in his chest. He sets the latch and softly slams the door. Janice has her key. He thinks of her over there in the Springer's big stucco house that has always reminded him of an abandoned, enormous ice cream stand. Forgive me. The next day, from a restaurant outside Richmond, he calls Nelson's house. Prue arrives at the telephone, breathless. Hi, Teresa. How's it going? This seductive, nonchalant tone, all wrong, but it just came out. Not so good, she says. Where on earth are you? Far away. Hey, what'd you tell for? Oh, Harry, I had to, she starts to cry. I couldn't let Nelson not know. He's trying to be so straight. He's just so desperate to lick the drugs and be a decent father and husband. Just be normal. He is, huh? Well, great. Still, you didn't need to turn us in. 
It only happened once, and there wasn't any follow-up. In fact, I thought you'd totally forgotten about it. How could you think I'd forgotten? You must think I'm a real slut. Well, no, but you know, you've been having a lot on your mind. For me, it was almost like I dreamed it. He means this as a compliment, but Prue's voice hardens. Well, it meant a little more to me than that. It was a terrible betrayal of my husband, she pronounces solemnly. Well, Rabbit says, he hasn't been all that great a husband as far as I can see. Another woman's voice, warmer, courteous, faintly lazy, probably black, breaks in, saying, Sir, your three minutes are up. Please deposit a dollar ten cents if you wish continuation. Maybe I'm done, he says to both women. Prue shouts over their imperiled connection. Harry, where are you? What shall I tell Janice? Tell her I'm on the way to the condo. Tell her she can join me whenever she wants. I just didn't like the squeeze you all put on me last night. He hangs up. Harry has never been in Florida this time of year before. It seems emptier, fewer cars in the driveways, more curtains drawn, the traffic thinner, even though this is rush hour. The guard at the security gate of Valhalla Village, a black Harry hasn't seen before, doesn't know him, but finds his name on the list of tenants and waves him through without a smile, all efficiency, probably college-educated, overqualified. The door of 413 opens easily. His two keys scratch into their wiggly slots and turn. The condo is like it always was, as absolutely still as a reconstruction of itself. Nobody bothered to disturb or rob the place. Kind of a snub. A white telephone sits waiting to ring. He picks it up. There is no buzz. God on the line. Disconnected for the season. Today is Sunday. Tomorrow is Labor Day. The old familiar riddle, how do you telephone the phone company without a telephone? But the phone, once it is connected, still doesn't ring. The days go by empty. The Valhalla dining room is spooky. Empty tables and echoing click of silver on china and bingo only once a week. At first he thinks Janice has tried so hard to reach him those four days before the phone got connected on Thursday that she's lost faith in their old number. Then he begins to accept her silence as a definite statement. I'll never forgive you. Okay, he'll be damned if he'll call her. The few times Harry has weakened impulsively, usually around four or five when he can't stand the sound of the golf games beginning up again, and it's still hours to dinner, the telephone in the little limestone house in Penn Park rings and rings without an answer. He hangs up in a way relieved. Nothingness has a purity. Each day down here, events in Pennsylvania seem more remote. His whole life seems, as he rotates through the empty condo rooms, each with its view across the parallel fairways to a wilderness of Spanish tile roofs, to have been unreal, or no realer than the lives on TV shows. And now it's too late to make it real, to be serious, to reach down into the earth's iron core and fetch up a real life for himself. In his solitude, his heart becomes his companion. He listens to it, tries to decipher its messages. It has different rhythms at different times of the day, a thrump, thrump, sluggish, slightly underwater beat in the morning, and toward evening, when the organism gets tired and excited at once, a more skittish thudding with the accent on the first beat and grace notes added, little trips and pauses now and then. It twinges when he gets up out of bed, and then again when he lies down, and whenever he thinks too hard about his situation, having set himself adrift like this. He makes an appointment with his regular doctor down here, Dr. Morris. The man has aged since Harry's last visit. He is bent over and shuffly with arthritic knuckles. Harry tries to describe his complex sensations. Dr. Morris with an impatient jerk of his arthritic hand, waves him toward the examination room. He seats him on the examination table and listens to his chest through his stethoscope, 
and taps his naked back with a soothing knobby touch and solemnly, silently takes Harry's hands in his. He studies the fingernails, turns them over, studies the palms, grunts. Well, Harry asks, what do you think? How much do you exercise? Not much. Uh, not since I got down here. You should walk, briskly, several miles a day. You should watch your sodium intake. Snack on fresh vegetables if you want a snack. Read the labels. I'll give you a diet list. I think we'd been through all this when you were in the hospital. The smell of good advice always makes Rabbit want to run the other way. But he does begin to walk. He sets out between nine and ten in the morning, after eating breakfast and digesting the news press, and then again between four and five. He explores Delion. First he walks the curving streets of low stucco houses within a mile of Valhalla village. Then he makes his way to the downtown and the river where the town first began as a fort in the Seminole Wars and a shipping point for cattle and cotton. He discovers, some blocks back from the beachfront and the green glass hotels, old neighborhoods where shadowy big spicy gentle trees overhang wooden houses once painted white but flaking down to gray bareness with louvered windows and roofs of corrugated tin. Music rises from within these houses, scratchy radio music, and voices raised in argument or jabbery jubilation, bright fragments of overheard life. Toward late afternoon, when he takes his second walk of the day, the neighborhood begins to breathe, a quickness takes hold. Men and boys return to it, and Rabbit walks more briskly, proclaiming with his stride that he is out for the exercise, just passing through, not spying. These blocks are black, and there are miles of them, a vast, stagnant economic marsh left over from Delian's southern past, supplying the hotels and condos with labor, with waiters and security guards and chambermaids. To Harry, whose Delian has been a glitzy community of elderly refugees, these blocks feel like a vast secret. Coming back one day around 6.30, just in time for a shower and a look at the news while his TV dinner heats in the oven, he is startled by the telephones ringing. He has ceased to listen for it so intensely as in that first lonely week. The caller is Nelson, his son. Dad? Yes, he says, gathering up his disused voice, trying to imagine what you can say to a son whose wife you've buffed. Nellie, he says, how the hell is everybody? The distant voice is gingerly, shy, also not sure what is appropriate. We're fine, pretty much. I've been putting this off, but I got some things to say. You've sure taken your time saying anything. I've been down here all by myself for two weeks. I saw old Dr. Morris, and he thinks I'm so far gone I should stop eating. Well, Nelson says back, if you were so crazy to talk, you could have come over that night instead of getting in the car and disappearing. We weren't going to kill you. We just wanted to talk it through, to understand what had happened, uh, really, in terms of family dynamics. Harry is not displeased to hear Nelson taking a firmer tone with him. Coming over there that night felt like a setup, he explains to Nelson. Well, Mom didn't think any of us should try to get in touch if that's the kind of cowardly trick you were going to pull. She wasn't too happy you telephoned Prue instead of her, either. I kept trying our number, but she's never home. Well, whatever. She wanted me to let you know a couple of things. One, she has an offer on the house. Not as much as she had hoped for. 185. But the market's pretty flat right now, and she thinks she should take it. It would reduce the debt to Brewer Trust to the point where we could manage it. Tell me, Nelson, I'm just curious. How does it feel to have smoked up your parents' house in crack? The boy begins to sound more like himself. He whines, I was never that much into crack. 
The crack just came into it toward the end. It was so much more convenient than freebasing. I'm sorry. Jesus. I went to rehab. I took the vows. I'm trying to make amends like they say. Who are you to still be on my case? Who indeed? Okay, Rabbit says. Sorry to mention it. What else did your mother tell you to tell me? Hyundai is interested in the lot. The location is just what they want and don't have. They'd keep the service people on with a little retraining and some of the sales force. But they don't want me. Word gets around, I guess, among these oriental companies. I guess, Harry says. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry, Dad. It frees me up. I'm thinking of becoming a social worker. Help other people instead of myself for a change. Sure, why not? Rabbit agrees. Me and the lawyers all think if it goes through, we should lease to Hyundai rather than sell. If we sell the house in Penn Park, we wouldn't need any more capital and could keep the lot as an investment. Mom says it's going to be worth millions by the year 2000. Wow, Harry says unenthusiastically. You and your mom are quite a team. Anything else to hit me with? Well, this maybe isn't any of your business, but Prue thought it was. We're trying to get pregnant. Great, Harry tells the boy. He can't resist adding. Though I'm not so sure social workers make enough to support three kids. And getting mad, feeling squeezed, he goes on. And tell your mother I'm not so sure I want to sign our house away. It's not like the lot. We're co-owners, and she needs my signature on the sales agreement. If we split up, my signature ought to be worth quite a bit, tell her. Split up? The boy sounds frightened. Who's saying anything about splitting up? Well, Harry says, we seem split up now. At least I don't see her down here, unless she's under the bed. But don't you worry about it, Nelson. You get on with your life. It sounds like you're doing fine. I'm proud of you. But everything kind of depends on selling the Penn Park house. Tell her I'll think about it, Harry says. Tell Judy and Roy I'll give them a call one of these days. But, Dad... Nelson, I got this low-cal frozen dinner in the oven, and the buzzer went off five minutes ago. Tell your mother to call me sometime if she wants to talk about it. Must run. Terrific to talk to you. Really. He hangs up. Harry does not always gravitate in his health walks to the black section of Delian. He discovers and explores posh streets he never dreamed were there, long roads parallel to the beach, giving the passerby glimpses of backs of houses that front on the ocean, wooden side stairs and sun decks, three-car garages. But it is the widespread black section that draws him back, he doesn't quite know why. Whether because he is exerting his national right to go where he pleases, or because this ignored part of Delian is in some way familiar. He's been there before, before his life got too soft. On the Monday after a pretty good weekend for blacks, a black Miss America got elected, and Randall Cunningham brought the Eagles back from being down to the Redskins twenty to nothing. Rabbit ventures several blocks further than he has dared walk before, and comes upon, beyond an abandoned high school built about when Brewer High was, a basketball court. A backboard and netless hoop, lifted up on pipe legs, preside at either end. A lone, tall boy, in denim cutoffs, is shooting baskets by himself. His tank top is an electric turquoise stenciled with a snarling tiger head. Eighteen at least, he is a dignified, deliberate performer, making good serious economical moves, dribbling in, studying the ground, staring at the hoop, sizing up the shot with two hands on the ball, letting go with the left hand underneath only at the last while shooting sitting on a bench at the opposite end of a small red knapsack the boy has evidently left there rabbit watches him a good while to vary his attitude harry sometimes tips his white face back as if to sunbathe coating his vision in red letting photons burn through 
his translucent eyelids. When he opens his eyes one time, the boy is standing close, darker than a cloud. You want something? His voice is light, level, unsmiling. No, nothing, Rabbit says. Am I sitting here bother you? You after no Scotty? The boy asks. No, thanks, he says. Never touch it. How about a little one-on-one, -on -one, though, since you seem to be out here alone? The boy, taken a bit off balance, thinks for an answer, and Rabbit's hands dart out and rest on the basketball. Its rough, smooth surface feels warm. Come on, he begs, growling the on. Give me the ball. Tiger's expression doesn't change, but the ball comes loose. With it, Harry strides onto the packed dirt. He goes for a jumper from pretty far out, and it lucks in. He and Tiger take shots alternately, careful not to touch and bouncing their passes to each other. You played once, the tall boy says. Long time ago, high school. Different style then than you guys have now. But if you feel like practicing your moves one-on-one, -on -one, I'm game. Play to 21? There seems a leaden sadness in Tiger's stare, but he nods and takes the ball bounce to him. Wait, Harry says. I better take a pill first. Don't mind me. The nitrostat burns under his tongue, and by the time Tiger has come in and has his layup blocked, and Rabbit has dribbled out and missed a twenty-footer, the pill's little kick has reached him. Rabbit lifts a few close-in jumpers over the boy's fingertips, soft, high, in, just like that, and Tiger begins to press tighter, inviting a turn around the corner and a break for the basket if Harry can find the surge. He is aware of his belly being slung up and down by the action and of a watery weariness entering into his knees, but adrenaline and nostalgia overrule. Rabbit accidentally, in one twist of upward effort, stares straight into the sun and can't for a minute brush away its blinking red moon of an afterimage. His chest feels full, his head dizzy, his pulse rustles in his ears. Hey, man, you all right? You puffin' pretty bad. You wait <laughs> till you're my age, Harry says. How about coolin' it? No big deal. This is gracious, Rabbit sees, through the sweat in his eyebrows and the pounding of his blood. He feels as if his tree of veins and arteries is covered with big pink blossoms. No big deal, you're too out of shape for this. No big deal, you aren't good enough for a little one-on-one. -on -one. Let's keep our bargain. Play to twenty-one, Harry says. He takes the ball out and stops short a step inside the half-court line and, unguarded, lets fly an old-fashioned two-handed set shot. He knows as it leaves his hands it will drop. A groove in the shape of the day guides it down. Man, Tiger says admiringly, that is pure horseshit. And he tries to imitate it with a long one-hander that rockets straight back off the rim. Rabbit grabs the rebound. He takes one slam of a dribble, carrying his foe on his side like a bumping sack of coal, and leaps up for the peeper. The hoop fills his circle of vision. It descends to kiss his lips. He can't miss. Up he goes, way up toward the torn clouds. His torso is ripped by a terrific pain, elbow to elbow. He bursts from within. He feels something immense persistently fumble at him and falls unconscious to the dirt. Tiger catches the ball on its fall through the basket and feels a body bump against him as if in purposeful foul. Then he sees the big old white man looking choked and kind of sleepy in the face collapse soundlessly like a rag doll being dropped. The impulse to run ripples through him, draining his head of practical thoughts. From the end of the bench he retrieves the knapsack and, holding it in the basketball close to his chest, walks briskly away. In the middle of the block, he begins to run under the high, excited sky. Seen from above, his limbs splayed and bent, 
Harry is as alone on the court as the sun in the sky, in its arena of clouds. Time passes. Then the social net twitches. Someone who in the houses bordering the lonely recreational field has been watching through a curtained window calls 911. The infarction looks to be transmural, a Florida doctor tells Janice and clarifies, right through the gosh darn wall. Even if by a miracle, ma'am, he were to pull through this present trauma, where you and I have healthy, flexible muscle, he'd just have a wad of scar tissue. You can replace arteries and valves, but there's no substitute yet for live heart muscle. He exudes controlled anger like a golfer who has missed three short putts in a row. He is so young, Janice groggily thinks, he blames people for dying. He thinks they do it to make his job more difficult. After last evening's visit from the Penn Park police and the struggle to get seats for herself and Nelson on some kind of flight to Florida, and then the empty condo, so tidy except for the stacks of old newspapers Harry would never throw out, and a few hours of ragged sleep that ended too early when the boys began to mow the greens. After all this, Janice felt much like her husband did, emerging from his long drive south on Labor Day weekend, as if her body has been pounded all over with sandbags. At this hour in the morning, a little after nine o'clock, with dirty breakfast trays still being wheeled along the halls, There is no one else in the intensive care waiting room, and Nelson, in his own agitation, keeps wandering off to telephone Prue to go to the bathroom to get a cup of coffee. A young black nurse appears at the open door and says, so softly, yet with a beautiful white smile, he's conscious now, and leads her into the intensive care unit. When she sees her Harry lying as white as his sheets, with all these tubes and wires going in and out of him, lying behind the wall of glass, an emotion so big she fears for a second she might vomit, hits her from behind, a crashing wave of sorrow and terrified awareness of utter loss, like nothing ever in her life except the time she accidentally drowned her own dear baby. She had never meant never to forgive him, She had been intending one of these days to call, but the days slipped by. Holding her silence had become a kind of addiction. How could she have hardened her heart so against this man, who for better or worse had placed his life beside hers at the altar? It hadn't been Harry, really. It had been Prue. What man could resist? She and Prue and Nelson had analyzed it to the point of exhaustion. She was satisfied it wouldn't happen again, and she had a life to get on with. Now this. The nurse slides the door open. Above his baby blue nose tubes for oxygen, his blue eyes are open, but he doesn't seem to hear. He sees her, sees his wife here, little and dark, complected and stubborn in her forehead and mouth, blubbering like a waterfall and talking about forgiveness. I forgive you, she keeps saying, while he can't remember for what. He lies there floating in a wonderful element, a bed of happy unfeeling that points of pain now and then poke through. She forgives him, and he thanks her, or thinks that he thanks her. He believes she takes his hand. His consciousness comes and goes, and he marvels that in its gaps the world is being tended to, just as it was in the centuries before he was born. He is nicely tired. He closes his eyes. His wife's familiar and beloved figure has been replaced by that of Nelson, who is also unhappy. You didn't talk to her, Dad, the kid complains. She said you stared at her but didn't talk. Okay, he thinks. What else am I doing wrong? Can't you say anything? Talk to me, Dad. The kid is yelling, or trying not to yell, his face white in the gills with the strain of it, and some unaskable question tweaking the hairs of one eyebrow so they grow up against the grain. He wants to put the kid out of his misery. 
From his expression and the pitch of his voice, the boy is shouting into a fierce wind blowing from his father's direction. Don't die, Dad! Don't! He cries, then sits back with that question still on his face and his dark, wet eyes shining like stars of the sort. Harry shouldn't leave the question hanging like that. The boy depends on him. Well, Nelson, he says, all I can tell you is it isn't so bad. Rabbit thinks he should maybe say more. The kid looks wildly expectant. But enough. Maybe. Enough. Enough.